know something of Stan's personal history, I've learned more today. I certainly have the facts in order, and I'd like to briefly review some of those with you. We are touched in many ways, and it will be clear when I start to mention this, just what those connections are. Uh, Stan has two degrees from Brown University. The first is a bachelor's, 1944, in mechanical engineering, but he met Bruce Lindsay as a sophomore, which... Uh, no, as a freshman. Freshman, which... In 1941 was transformative, and uh, his second degree, a master's, was taken in physics in 1945. Uh, you then went to MIT for several years to do additional postgraduate work, then went to the U.S. Navy Underwater Sound Laboratory in New London, Connecticut from 1948 to 53. Then Raytheon Company, which became your home for the next uh, 40 years. Uh, Stan rose from the rank of senior engineer to consulting engineer, which was the highest te technical staff position at Raytheon Company. You would have to become a manager to exceed that, uh, but Stan was comfortable at the highest technical rank at Raytheon Company. Well, that was higher than many manage banks, management ranks, actually. <laughs> we appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, uh, he has been a, a member of the Acoustical Society of America since 1948, if memory is correct. Yeah. Uh, I joined as soon as I had enough money to join. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any money before that. He served as president of the society after the typically long gestation period as vice president-elect, vice president, president-elect with uh, a, a mandatory gap in between to space things out. Uh, that was 1996 to 1997, so uh, almost within the last 10 years you served as the president of the society. Uh, Stan was associate editor for the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America for 21 years in transduction. By then he had exceeded the three-term limit by four terms, <laughs> <laughs> but identified his successor, Alan Zuckerwar, uh, who, like Stan, uh, is a silver medalist of the Acoustical Society of America. So there's much distinction here. At the same time, during the same period, uh, Stan served as editor-in-chief of the IEEE Journal of Oceanic Engineering, 1981 to 87. We have one of his successors here with us, and uh, it's a very strong going concern, but only because of the work of our the, the journal was a jet, just about to fold, and they asked me if I would take it over. <laughs> and, I, and I brought it back to life, actually, and it's going, still going strong. Seems to be alive. That was a major resuscitation. <clears throat> yeah, it was. <laughs> today I view it as a gold mine for technology in the whole oceanic engineering area, not just underwater sound but a very important reference source for people working in this area. Uh, Stan founded a chapter in acoustics for the ASA. Uh, he's received a number of awards. Uh, in addition to the Silver Medal of the Society, he received the Mirapal Gold Medal <coughs> awarded by an Indian society, and uh, subsequently a Silver Medal in 2007 for work done to foster international collaboration. My, I met Stan in 1968. He taught underwater sound at Raytheon Company Submarine Signal Division. And uh, we have several alums here of SubSig, which I understand you joined in 1960? What? As, as Submarine Signal Division of Raytheon Company. Yes. Uh, in 1960, we moved to Rhode Island. Following the sonar. It was still a submarine signal. <coughs> Before that, much of the sonar work was being done in Massachusetts. Uh, for instance, Boston, Waltham, Wayland, Newton, but eventually it was consolidated in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And, uh, 
and uh, worked there for more than 30 years at that location. Uh, 38 years with them. With the uh, Raytheon Company. Uh, in addition to doing some teaching of an influential character, uh, I believe Tan, uh, Stan has a very special ability in approximation, as in the art of approximation. Uh, we all know the story of Enrico Fermi uh, measuring the first atomic blast, how much energy was actually expended by dropping paper balls out of his pocket, measuring the deflection from the blast wave, and he came within 10% of the yield. But uh, all the years I knew Stan at the submarine signal company, he could do that. He, uh, he knew his logarithms and uh, <laughs> could do a lot even without a slide rule. Uh, not to mention a digital <coughs> computer. I want to interrupt here because he told me he uh, memorized the log tables and he interpolated in his head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I took care of multiplication and division. <laughs> so uh, we'd like to just ask you. Well, uh, I even have an older one that I got. I got my picture in the paper in the Providence Journal back in 1930 when I was five years old. And uh, you, you have the, I think you, you have the scrapbook from that now. Uh, Steve does, yes. What? My brother does. Oh, okay. But at any rate, uh, what happened? Why, I, I, when I was five years old, I was able to figure out, in, that was 1930, uh, I was able to figure out the day of the week that any day during 1930 came. You know, like if you told me uh, June 4th, 1930, I would tell you what day of the week it was. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, uh, and uh, they, they, they wrote me up for that, and I got, got a bunch of extra things copied around, and every once in a while they, they even republished some of these things from way back then, but that <laughs> doesn't happen too much anymore. But, uh, but that was my first publication. <laughs> Pretty impressive at five years old. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> well, it was surprises me now that I did too, but I, I did. And uh, I found a, a formula for doing it so I can do it all the way back and forth over a, almost any number of years. And you have to make a correction uh, big when they change the calendar from. Uh, Julian to Gregorian back in 1752. Um, a walking perpetual calendar <laughs> calculator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yes, exactly. Uh, I guess I'd like to elaborate too on what Ken said because I, I, I started at Raytheon, uh, uh, well, you were already a consulting engineer and I was uh, at that point at the entry level, which was the senior engineer. And, but what was impressive was, what was it, the first major project I was on involved um, um, uh, designing arrays and, 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 um, and developing the amplitude shading coefficients to, uh, to uh, based on a certain specification for beam width uh, and side lobe level. And um, certainly we had the mainframe computer batch mode uh, where you, you submit, submit the, the card of, uh, you know, the whole stack of cards and everything, and, and it took a day to come back with syntax errors and so on. It took, took a whole week just to get anything running, and uh, which is five attempts, basically. But, um, but, but Stan um, did it his own way, without a computer. And, and uh, I remember just how admired he was and respected by everyone there, uh, because they would ask him for a task, and he would just give back uh, something Handwritten uh, the shading coefficients. I, I'm talking about you know a, a, an n by m array of <laughs> with certain specifications, and he just figured it out. Um, you know, the, the, the coefficients, and, and they were just taken without question because they, they gave terrific results. And uh, but again, it's along the line of having a deep, intuitive feeling for things and being able to just do it on first principles and come very close to the optimum answer, of it, if not hitting it. Um, and, so anyway, while well, the rest of us were turning the crank on an unwieldy uh, computing system at that point and taking weeks to get results. <laughs> uh, this is probably a good point to ask you about your work on super directivity. 
Okay, well, uh, I was trying to get the number of point arrays to, uh, to, to form a beam without getting a lot of the noise in, involved in, in, in the, you know, and superdirectivity is a way to cut out the noise. However, you start with a whole lot of noise and you have to figure out a way to cut that out first. And, uh, and to be able to pick up a, 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 a small signal in a, in a fairly large amount of noise. And so you try to make the array, uh, uh, if the noise is, is, is uh, fairly uniform, you try to do that by cutting out the noise from all directions except the one you are looking for. And up to a point you can do that, providing you don't get too high a side lobe problem. Uh, because sometimes you get side lobes that uh, uh, that get get too high and, and, and destroy the advantage of the of the array, which is what what you're trying not to do. And the other thing is with superdirectivity is is you try uh, try to use some of the same principles uh, to establish uh, f uh, from what direction a noise is coming. And you try to get 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 the array to be directionally sensitive, and you can do do that uh, if the with uh, either with a superdirect array or, or if 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 the noise isn't too he heavy, you can do it with just a two co two a sine and a cosine and an omnidirectional uh, array, and that can be all be put onto one cylinder. Because you can get a, you can have a plus and minus uh, this way, and then rotate it 90 degrees, and uh, and then have just an omni, and uh, between the three of them, you, you use the omni to blank out. Uh, you you put a phase shift in the omni. You use the omni to blank out one part of the uh, uh, deal, and so uh, uh, it picks up the two positive uh, quadrants, that sort of thing, and you pick up. From that, which is which direction it's coming from, and, and, and it, it, it tends to work out pretty well. And it's been used in various large sizes for uh, small, low, low frequencies and small sizes for high frequencies, uh, so that you can cover about an octave or so at a time with with these things. And if and after a while, it doesn't pay to cover. Very much because when the sound gets too high in frequency, it doesn't come from too far. You don't need much. Was, was there an ambiguity? It was called a multi mode. It was called a multi mode array. And it was uh, done with with, uh, with a omnidirectional and a, a sine cosine. But it could resolve the ambiguity in. You could, could resolve the ambiguity, the 180 degree ambiguity. The Omni helps you to resolve <coughs> the ambiguity mm -hmm. by how it matches up with the uh, sine and cosine. So is this what's used in the DIFAR son of buoys? What? In the DIFAR son of buoys, is it that principle that's used? Oh, okay. It's used somewhere else. Well, that's a question, actually. Oh, I don't know whether... Uh, underwater it was a question because people... Because they, what what submarines were trying to do is they were trying to find if somebody was pinging on them, and uh, they were trying to find the direction the ping was coming from in that case, so they could take some action, mm -hmm. either to run away from it or or to go and attack, uh, depending upon what they were choosing to do. Uh, Stan, if you would like, we have a a board here. No, it's okay. Uh, I, I I don't think. Uh, if somebody needs something on the board, I'll put it on, but... Uh, okay. um, now, you received several patents for this, is that I, right? I, I received either only one or two patents to receive for that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, two, I think. Yeah, and uh, did this result in a device that Raytheon manufactured? This, this resulted in some manufacturing facility, because we manufactured some, some of these arrays, yes. Right, and we had we had a hook on the market for a while, and then we get some competition. Yeah, um, 
I was uh, curious about your possible involvement in development of <coughs> parametric sonar at Raytheon Company. In, the, in my involvement in the what of sonar? Pa uh, parametric sonar. Parametric. Parametric sonar. I believe uh, Walsh was uh, helping to develop that. Yeah, George Walsh. Yeah, I didn't do too much of that. I didn't do too much of that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> also, you were involved with development of magnetostrictive transducers? Well, when I first joined the sound lab in 1948, they were working with Permandera magnetostrictive transducers. Permandera is an alloy of iron. It's 49% iron, 49% cobalt, and 2% vanadium. And the reason the vanadium is there is uh, to make it uh, pliable and malleable. Uh, so uh, the, the, the <coughs> iron and cobalt are there uh, to uh, provide the magnetostrictive capability. And uh, both iron and cobalt are, are magnetostrictive. And, uh, what you wind up doing is you wind up uh, learning about mag uh, magnetic hysteresis and magnetic loops and things of that sort. And what you try to do is you try to polarize the <coughs> magnetic attractive material so instead of it being a square law device, it becomes a linear device uh, about the uh, 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 about the point, uh, the remnant point to which you have it, or, or about whatever the uh, midpoint is of the uh, that you drive it around. And you try to make it nearly linear just to keep the losses <coughs> down and the heating down. And uh, and so uh, so it it it, it becomes it, it becomes piezomagnetic, but it's not a naturally piezoelectric. There is no naturally piezomagnetic substance uh, uh, the, 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 like piezoelectrics, for example. <coughs> in piezoelectrics, you'll find uh, quartz and uh, and Rochelle salt and things of that sort have uh, have piezoelectric properties, and uh, but then of course you also find the cobalt of uh, the uh, uh, magnetic attractive materials and the ferroelectric materials like barium titanate and uh, and other other things of that sort. And uh, other various titanates and things that exist, and what you do with them is you try to polarize them to make them uh, uh, piezo effectively piezoelectric, and you can do a better job with them actually. But uh, but you do a good job with the magnetic restrictive one too. And I did work on another magnetic restrictive material that. Now, the, you know, the Al Al Allegheny Ludlum used to make the Primandure, and both the, the sound lab in New London and Raytheon were working with it. Raytheon was manufacturing sonar systems with transducers using Primandure. And uh, while I was at, at, at the lab uh, in New London, uh, they, Westinghouse came out with a material called Hyperco, and its main advantage was and it was still magnetostrictive, but it was only 35% cobalt, which was an expensive material. And the only trouble was it, it, it did not have the kind of properties that Permanger did. And it, it, uh, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a good uh, substitute. Uh, it, it did work, but it, 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 it uh, didn't work well enough to be, uh, to, to be, to, to be a replacement for, for Permanger. So I had a lot of experience playing around with Permanger, and uh, were you, were did a lot of work with minor loops and things like that, as well as the major loops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had a question. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask if you were building prototypes or look, looking at the properties of the material itself to pass on to a prototype division, or were you actually building prototype sources, or or even designing production? I'm missing your question. Were you, maybe, were maybe you maybe purely doing, were you purely doing research on the material itself, or building a proto to pass on to a prototype source development uh, 
eight, you know, division or were you we, building we, we have the hypercar. prototypes? We, you, you just had to uh, make a ring stack of it to test the material. Right, but did you design, did, we did, did you do we, we, top to bottom, you know, materials, source engineering, packaging for uh, pr production units? Or I, uh, the only thing I did that I patented was the, uh, what, what was the directional sensor. Yes. So, yeah, other things, uh, well, I had patents. He wants to know if you were part of every aspect of the, the research to production, or which aspect were you part of? Oh, uh, well, I was part of the, uh, I, I wasn't in the production of, of uh, sonar system. I was in the engineering backup for, for the production when I was at Raytheon. And if there was a problem, then uh, we had to figure out how to get, get around it. Okay. In the in the production system, I see. Okay, I don't know. We, we were trying to keep the stuff. people in production out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I was in it, in transduction a lot too, uh, uh, as opposed to the system as a whole. And then uh, after a while, I was involved in the whole system, and you could work your way through the system from from the transducer all the way to the display. Right. Yeah. There are some follow-ups to this, but uh, before we leave transduction, most of us are using piezoelectric transducers. Uh, or, or, or we sometimes you use piezoelectrically polarized. Uh, p p in other words, uh, you've used barium titanate, don't you? The, the, yeah, barium titanate is ferroelectric, you see. Yeah. But it's polarized to be piezoelectric. The uh, magnetostrictive transducers are very robust. Do you see them as still having a future or uh, potential yeah. applications, maybe for deep sea work? They're not. They're, they're yeah, robust, but they're expensive, and and, uh, and they're also uh, hard to manufacture, relatively relative to the. Others where you can just uh, uh, the ceramic transducers are, are, are a lot cheaper and a lot easier to fabricate, and cost is a major factor in most things that the government buys. But for uh, let us say deep sea applications or applications in water with ice, when you're working at the surface. <coughs> it would seem the magnetostrictive transducers are they they they, they can robust. handle they can handle the deep sea very nicely <clears throat> and you you have to work a little harder to get the ceramic transducers to take the because they can be crushed and things like that they 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 are not as as strong if you absolutely have to have it but most things that are on board a ship uh, don't go down that deep. Even submarines don't don't go don't go too deep because they, otherwise they crush too. We're we're fond of putting sources at all sorts of great depths. Dan. What I said we're fond of putting sources at all sorts of great depths. So uh, we're some of the exceptions to the rule around here. Oh, okay. Yes. We are uh, currently developing a vehicle that will go to the deepest. Of the ocean. Well, they have bathyspheres and things like that that will go down as deep as the ocean goes. Yeah, we're interested in putting sources on them. Though. <laughs> yeah. What? Uh, we're interested in putting acoustics on them. Or yes. positioning and so forth. Everything. Yeah. So True. this is 11,000 meters. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's about as far as you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's about right. Yeah. Um, a follow-on question uh, uh, concerns looking at the total system. Uh, I know you've been involved in standards and calibration work for a long time. Uh, can you tell us anything about that? Not a whole lot, actually. Uh, I have been involved, but uh, I've been involved in just making sure that things stay together and make sense, but I don't remember a lot of that anymore. And uh, 
uh, I've been involved lately with an IEEE standards committee, and they, they have a new way of expressing, uh, there's a new international dating system, uh, which most of you probably are not using yet, but the year comes first, and then the month, and then the day, so today would be 08, 11, and 05. So, so IEEE's turned everything on its head again. Well, well, the European <laughs> standard had the had the uh, day, day, month, and year. And year. Mm -hmm. This is the year, month, and day, and it's not the year, day, and month like we normally have been using. But they they finally came to an agreement and that, and that, it, on that. Are they going to make it a four-digit year? What? Are they going to make it a four-digit year so we don't wind up with 08? You can get away with two, two <laughs> with two, two digits for the year, if you want. As long, as long as you know what century you're in. I was going to say. Yeah. For, the next, for the next 90 years. All we need is three, really. We don't need four. We only need three. The answer is it can be a four-digit year whenever you need it to be. By the way, I like that system, and I've been using it to label data for quite some time. And one of the nice things about it is when you do a sort, or I mean, when you list things, alphabetically, everything is in order. So I heartily embrace the, the it. The thing is that this is a never-increasing deal, which is a, one nice thing about it. Yeah. yeah it has a monotonic character. Monotonic, yeah. But the, uh, certainly those first two digits, 20. No, 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 use 08. Yes, I know that, but it identifies it as a year. Uh, there are many if, 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 codes, if, so. if you get into more than one century, you have to use the 2008. But you'd have to use that anyhow if you got into more than one century. Mm -hmm. yeah. Probably. Yeah. Now, uh, you participated in the ASA standards work, I believe, for a very long time. I may have, but I just don't remember uh, I'm still excited. much <laughs> happening. I've forgotten, de I've forgotten details. Well, that is the reputation for standards work, but it is essential. And as soon as we discover incompatibilities, then we realize that we are a victim of lack of attention to standards. We take it for granted that there are a lot of things that work only because of standards. Well, the standards make life easier, uh, are intended to make life easier, so that people can understand each other without a long harangue. <laughs> Much safer, too. Safer also, uh, use of electricity. Well, uh, yeah, 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 true. I'd like to ask you about uh, literature. Um, what journals uh, you read or what you have read in the past? Uh, do you maintain currency in different areas? Well, I still have a complete set of the acoustical journal, and I'm back to 1929. But I'm trying to get that together with, with the help of my daughter and granddaughter, because I think I'd like to give it away to somebody who I can, can use it, probably to burn or something set like of the that. Yeah. Yeah, there's not so many of those around anymore. Well, yeah. Yeah. But I, I bought the back issues when they were made available. Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, I had only owned it from 49 on originally as, as, as a member. Well, this, this does still have value. The journal is now available electronically. But there are many examples that we encounter where the text, the electronic text, is not legible. Oh, that's The characters right. are too fine, or the original was more annotated, was yeah, oh, marked yeah. up. Oh, yeah. It yeah. was the only one available for scanning. That, so, that, uh, can, that can happen. I hope the family's aware there is some value here. So the family is happy to find a home for home this. For it. <laughs> <laughs> you want, you want to help uh, us find a home for it? I'd be happy yeah, I know. I, I appreciate 
Well, that, oh, fact, it's space issues for libraries, but uh, I, I hope you're successful. When Barbara was living at home, I had a, we had a so appointed with a lot of journals. <laughs> she probably remembers that. <laughs> so, well, we can, if anybody knows, I'm happy to, it's sitting there. Have you talked to Elaine Moran and the Acoustical Society and stuff? Do they I have, haven't done that. I you might actually talk to the Acoustical Society to say if they can have an extra archival oh. copy or something yeah, yeah. like that. Because mm -hmm. right. that... Uh, like like Ken says, there's a few issues right now. I think if they had better copies, they could probably rescan and the rest of it. But the uh, okay, I mean Thanks. the rest of us have worked overtime to actually eliminate some of our paper copies. So it's uh, but to have a couple of archival copies back would definitely be worth the. Okay, that's good. I'm making a note of it. I would like to follow this up with you yeah, yeah. Um, later, yeah. and uh, just talk about possible disposition. Uh, the Journal of the Oceanic Engineering Society, do you also have a complete set? Of what? J-O-E? Journal of Oceanic oh, yeah, I, I know. I, I don't know. I, I think I've been throwing them out lately. So one of, one of my tasks is to look in the attic to see what is actually there. So that, that will happen. I, I, I was only editor-in-chief of that for six years. Uh, mm. does it in 19... What? <laughs> Same here. Six years is enough. Yeah, well, I, I decided it was enough, and uh, uh, they gave me a silver medal last year, somewhere along the line, or a citation of some, some sort from the Oceanic Engineering Society. Actually, if you have back issues of that, that would be worth it, because there's not so many of those around yet. But you, uh, I think it was mostly a certificate. Like the Oceanic Engineering one, because that's actually a smaller collection, but we've... We've actually archived the whole thing right now, but again, to have an archival copy somewhere would be good, and I'd be happy to help you with that. Okay. Well, I, again, I've made a note of it to follow yeah, up, but we'll, we'll be in touch. Please, yeah, Ken latch is, on to Ken it. Don't worry. And I, you know, I work with Jim, and uh, but hold on to it if you come across any of the journal issues. We're well up to date for current issues since your tenure as editor in chief, but the 1980s—that's a dark. I'll Fine for this I journal. The public, the, it's hard. Okay, if you have some, that'd be yeah. great. The, 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 the publication run was very modest at that time. I remember putting out an edition with just one paper in it because the, uh, we hit a s snag in, uh, in the getting the papers to come in. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, I, I had a friend in Italy who... Uh, who was an associate editor, and he was slow in getting papers, and I finally got him to release and that, some of the papers that he'd been holding on to. And we finally finished off with some of, it, some of the papers that he, that he finally sent me, but uh, he was an associate editor, mm -hmm. and there had been a fair amount of work going on over there, and I just figured we ought to horn in on it. This was somebody at the Seclant Center? So we did. But 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 he but he was just holding on and holding on, <laughs> and, and that's not the way to run a it's not the way to run a journal. But that's typically what happens. It'd be, a be, of it'd be, it'd be, be better to make a mistake and publish one that was wrong than a, than uh, than to hold up twenty. Oh, was, he, yeah. was he not working at it, or was he waiting to make it perfect? There are usually two two <laughs> different reasons for it. Well, you try to make. Make 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 sure there are no major mistakes, and uh, yeah, you can, you can right. If you, if if there's a major mistake, you don't want to no, do join it. But if if it's a, but if it's just a minor one, you can sort of skim over it and assume that people will pick it up. Uh, are there any other journals that uh, you have made use of frequently in the past? Mm. Not, not really. I occasionally looked at some of the other IEEE journals, but uh, I used to get a fair batch of them, but I, I don't anymore. Do you still follow any active research area, Stan? Do you still have some I, I just retired. I, I just, I've that decided was that it was time for me to let yeah. it go. Yeah. And, I'm 83 now, so. I, I'm, not, I'm just wondering. <laughs> uh, 
And as I told my daughter coming down here, I'm working on 150. <laughs> we all are. Right. Well, there, there, there's also some modesty here because uh, you do participate in an ASA subcommittee on standards. Uh, you're involved still in the IEEE uh, SSC 14 yes. committee for standardization. I still once in a while go to their meeting. And you write reviews for the journal. You, you still do work for the Journal of the Acoustical Society. No, I don't do any work for any journal anymore now. I, I, I gave, well, gave free, freed myself completely. They made me give it up in 2002. They told me I couldn't be an associate editor anymore because I'd already had seven terms and I was only entitled to three. <laughs> <laughs> You got that. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier that uh, you met or knew Philip Morse. Philip Morse? What? Uh, yeah, yes, I, I met Philip Morse when he was at MIT. Were you working together at all? No, no. no. Or we, he, he was about to, he was more or less retired about then. Or about to retire. He was st still had an office there, but he didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, so he was young enough to have an office, but not old enough to be that active in doing uh, anything. And Bolt eventually took over while I was still there, took over the laboratory, the acoustics lab. Mm -hmm. um, did you know the acoustics group at Brown University? Uh, Robert Byer, Peter Westerveld, Arthur Williams? Yeah, I, 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 knew, all, I knew all of them. Yeah, at Williams too. Right. And then what, when you yeah, the, the order was, I guess, uh, Lindsay was the oldest and Williams was next oldest and Bayer was, who just passed away a week or so ago, was next oldest. He was, he was 88 and, uh, and Westerbelt was the youngest of the bunch. He was about my age. While you were at Raytheon, did you have, uh, was there a discussion going on with that group at Brown? Did you have any common interests? What? Uh, were you also what? meeting with the Brown Physics Department? Did you have contact with Bayer, Westervelt, Williams? When I was there, you mean? When, when you were at Raytheon. Oh, when I was at Raytheon. Not appreciably, no. I believe Peter Westervelt did have contact maybe with uh, George Walsh, development of parametric sonar. Yeah, well, he, he was involved in that. You're not going to make a nonlinear acoustician out of me here, Ken. When, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when you were at Raytheon, when you were at Raytheon, <coughs> did you generally have contact with the academic acoustics world, or did you operate really separately and only through the... Well, I was the still active in the Acoustical Society. Yeah, through the society, so, not so directly through the society. The so that was my main deal, and uh, I always maintained contact with the Lindsay's. Uh, they, in fact, they used to have a summer home uh, in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, which is on the same island I live on, and they moved to there uh, after he retired. And uh, my late wife and I used to pick them up and take them to the local acoustical meetings. And we even used to take Mrs. Lindsay to the meetings after Bruce died. Uh, you also and they, they, they had a son in my class at Brown, Bob Lindsay. What was his career? Who? Bob Lindsay. I don't know what he did. I don't know. I don't know what he or his sister Evelyn did. But you were in mechanical engineering at the time. I, I, I was, when I was at Brown, I, at, in my bachelor's days, I was a me, training to be a mechanical engineer. And that just mean, meant taking a couple of different courses in your senior year than you did if you were a civil or uh, electrical. Mm -hmm. Right. What brought you into
into acoustics. What brought you into acoustics? I think Bruce Lindsay. Bruce I was attracted to, to him. Uh, and probably, of course, I was attracted to acoustics because I was hard of hearing, even then. Nobody had trouble hearing Bruce. <laughs> Well, I, I could hear a lot better than I can now. I didn't need a hearing aid then. Uh, but uh, now even my right ear needs a hearing aid. The left ear is essentially totally deaf. It's a candidate for one of these CIE implants if I want one. There you go. <laughs> and and I t t t I've chosen that too. Yeah. Yeah, uh, covered the topics that I had that I wanted to ask you about. But does anyone else have anything? I think you've covered most of my career. Oh, yeah. Well, there's, there, there, there's, there, there are large areas I know we can't touch, um, just because of the nature of your work with Sonar at Raytheon Company. Not too much. <laughs> But There's not much that you, you can't you can't talk about at this point because most yeah, of it has been declassified stuff, yeah. that I've worked with. Well, I, I say that there are benefits to that <laughs> declassification. Well, <laughs> we used to send people out on sea trips so a fair amount of the time. I, I didn't go very often. I went once in a while. We used to have one fellow named Bill Gorton who used to go there out to sea quite frequently. And uh, at one point I became his supervisor, as it turned out, and, and uh, had him go out to sea. And he stayed over at my house occasionally when he was about ready to go out, because he used to live in Belmont, Massachusetts. And he used to drive down to Portsmouth. And, uh, which is a fair drive, actually. But he had been there when they had been through all the Boston area. He was a little older than I was. So, and, uh, how, how often is fairly frequently? Wh who's talking? Uh, over here. When, when you say he went to sea fairly frequently, uh, how is that twice a year or <laughs> twice a month? Or what? How? how how many trips per year did he make? How? You said how he, many trips a year did he make? You said that he went to see. Oh, I, I didn't go very often. I, Not uh, you, but I went other. once or twice a year. That's about all. Okay. Well, some people would consider that. Uh, with <laughs> with a lot. <laughs> I I didn't go a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Bill used to go uh, several times a year. So, 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 yeah, every couple of months he was out to sea. <clears throat> okay, because we have some people who go out maybe 20 times per year. No, I, without more than once, but not too often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, were you involved in the search for the thresher? No. Because Raytheon had engineers on board at that time. I, yes. And there was a question about identifying the cause of the accident based on analysis of acoustic I, records. I might have had something about it, but I didn't, it wasn't involved very heavily. Uh, I don't remember too much about it. Do you remember, was there any contact uh, at that, when you were at Raytheon between Submarine Signal Division and the Woods Hole Oceanographic? I don't, I don't know. They could well have been, but I don't know. Not with you. Though. What? Not with you. <laughs> okay. Um, do I have any other questions? Uh, or is there something you'd like to tell us about that uh, we haven't asked? Well, I think you've covered uh, everything that I can't think of. Something to tell you that that would wouldn't be repetitious. <laughs> I'm curious, so often, I, I, I what? so often in research, one studying something and 
by accident get on to something new. Did you have any experiences like that where just by chance you seem to discover something and go off in a different direction? Well, I, 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 went and I got involved in this uh, deal of, of trying to find the location of uh, somebody pinging at you. Mm -hmm. And that, was, uh, that got me off in a direction that kept me busy for a while, keeping things straight. And, uh, making it work with either a ferroelectric or a ferromagnetic transducer. Mm -hmm. It worked, it can do it either way. There is uh, something else I would like to ask you about. Uh, I remember uh, talking with you, Tim, about uh, the analog digital transition. This was had major impact in the, the what digital analog to digital. Analog to digital. It was a revolution, and it certainly impacted Raytheon <coughs> Company sonar work. Some of it, but it didn't impact too much of it. I mean, most transducers would have stayed analog. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was when you get into the signal processing that you went digital, mm -hmm. and that, then uh, then that became important. And uh, I I I get get into it only very slightly because. Uh, and things weren't as digital in 1991 as they are now, even. So. Well, I recall the Navy mandating digital processing, and this was early 1970s, so that was a major time of transition. Yes. But I guess you were so close to the transducer end that you were less affected by that. Well, some things could be done in analog if you used clipping. And, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> what? I see. And uh, you could get away with, with a very small loss compared to the amount of expense you would have to pay to go for digital. I think the um, early beam former, the uh, Dimbus. What? The Dimbus, <laughs> beam former, <coughs> Dimbus, beam former. Uh, the, the one bit, uh, I think it was Digital multi-beam synthesis. Oh, Dimas, yes. yeah, yes. yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Digital multi-beam steering. Yes. Yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. I think that was, a, 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 that was one bit. Was that right? Yeah, that was a one bit. Yes. The clip one bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And it worked very well, actually. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Well... I'll just ask something kind of more an impression. Um, <clears throat> you know, since you've hung around the Oceanic Engineering Society and the Acoustical Society for a couple of decades, um, do you think things look more exciting years ago, or do they look just about the same now? Or I think there are always exciting things going on, and uh, you just have to look for them and work with them. Uh, the things don't just start and end, uh, they, they just keep going. <laughs> oh, just wondering, yeah, are you impression? Good. Yeah, and, uh, just, and some things get more attention than others, that's all. Uh, okay, well, thank you, Stan. Thanks, thanks for coming over here. Thanks. Well, I, th th I thank you for inviting me down here to talk with you, and uh, I've enjoyed it, and it's a good chance to relive some of my past life. Did, did you get a tour around here at all? Did you, uh, Ken? <coughs> no, no, but I think I want to head back. We have some yeah. plans. Oh, you have some do you have a few minutes? What? We can, we can give have you a, a little short, short tour. tour around. Yeah, oh, oh, we can have time. Okay, you, we have time for a little tour. Right? Yeah, my daughter's uh, okay, keeping track of me. I think you'd enjoy that. I think you'd enjoy that. Oh, robotic vehicle. Oh, yeah.